Hello and welcome, I'm your Code Monkey. A while ago, Mark Brown from the channel Game Maker's Toolkit did an excellent beginner's guide for Unity. It's a great video, if you're a beginner or you want to get a quick refresher on the basics, go ahead and give it a watch. It covers the absolute basics on making a game kind of like Flappy Bird with some really nice editing that makes it really easy to follow. I definitely wish I had one tenth of his editing skills. I started writing a comment pointing out some more things to help beginner go one level past the complete beginner stage. And that comment ended up huge and super detailed, so I figured I'd make a quick video version covering all of the points that are exactly one level above absolute beginners. By the way, if you want to learn Blender 3D modeling, there's an excellent humble bundle with a bunch of courses and the usual extremely deep 98% off discount. I followed the complete Blender Creator course myself last year, and I managed to go from complete beginner to being able to build some nice models. Or if you just want to pick up some ready-made assets, then there's also a sale on the Cinti Store. Lots of packs for everything you can think of, all in their signature gorgeous low poly style. So check out both sales with the links in the description. So let's take a look at the slightly more advanced concepts and some clarifications. Starting off with naming rules. As I've mentioned many times before, you can use whatever naming rules you want. You can use a prefix in your variables, use a postfix, use capitals for constants, camel case for properties, snake case for fields. Any of those can work. By the way, here are the definitions of what those mean in case you don't know them. Pascal case starts with a capital and every word is capitalized. Camel case starts with lowercase and then uppercase for the first letter of every other word, kind of like a camel hump in the middle. And snake case is where you add an underscore in between the words. Like I said, every rule can be valid. The important thing is that you are consistent in always following through with your rules. As you might know, Unity mono behaviors have some default functions you can implement, so things like start and update, which are written using Pascal case. Since you cannot really change Unity's own rules, that means that at least on function names, I would say you should probably base your rules off of theirs. So for functions, you should probably use pass on case. For the other rules, like I said, choose whatever makes sense to you. Here are some of my own personal rules that I've developed over the last 10 years. For functions, I use Pascal case, just like Unity and just like the C Sharp standard. For function parameters, I use camel case. For fields, also camel case. Properties are in Pascal case. Constants are in uppercase snake case. For a rule that's a bit more controversial, personally, I like the opening curly brackets on the same line. I do hope this statement doesn't start a war in the comments. It's just the visual style that I personally prefer. Visually, I think it looks better on the same line, but if you like new line, then go ahead and use that. And a final rule, which is simply spend some time deciding on a proper name and don't be afraid to rename things. Never use a variable with a single letter, like X or K. The exception, of course, would be iterators on something like a for loop. Also, do not use acronyms or abbreviation. Those might seem clear to you right now, but in a few weeks you might not remember what they mean. Remember, you don't get bonus points for writing extremely compact code, so make sure you make your code readable and understandable, even if it requires variables and functions with very long names. So these are my general rules for the code style that I personally follow. Figure out what works for you and always make sure to follow your own rules. Next topic, magic numbers. These are numbers that you use directly in your code, which have some sort of magical meaning that is not immediately apparent. For example, in the video, he uses a 10 here. Now, what does that mean? If you watch the video where he is writing the code, then it's clear what it does. When writing the code, you always know exactly what you're writing, but you will quickly forget the meaning of that value after some time. So instead of using magic numbers, always make sure to use a variable, either a member variable or just a simple local variable, and give it a proper descriptive name that clearly indicates what that variable represents. You can see the huge difference to the code readability when Mark changes it to a proper variable. With that simple change, the code is much, much easier to understand. If you were to get back to that code sometime in the future, you would have no problem understanding what it was doing because there are no magic numbers involved. I covered more about magic numbers in detail in another video if you want to learn more. Next topic, why you should not make everything public. This is an extremely important topic and one where I already made a dedicated video on. Basically, when you make something public, you are enabling both read and write access from anywhere in your entire codebase. Meaning that if you have a thousand classes, then you have a thousand places where you could be modifying that field. For example, in the video, the rigid body field is set as public, but you don't really want another random class to randomly modify that field. If you had another script that set that field to no while the game was running, then everything would break. With the field set as public, there is nothing to stop that from happening. So the better approach is to make it private. That way, only that one class can read or write to that field. No other class can modify it in any way. Good programming is all about minimizing complexity. The more you limit how accessible something is, the easier it is to understand. 
You don't need to keep in mind the entire code base since only the code in that class can read or write to that field. So in that case, you have two better options. You can make it private, but then of course you have the issue where you can't drag references in the inspector. Now, since a rigid body happens to be on the same game object, you can grab the reference with get component. That's one approach. Another approach is make it private, but add the attribute serialized field. This one lets you make a field private, so it's not accessible from any class, but because it's serializable, it is accessible from the Unity editor. So with that, you can drag the reference in the editor directly. Again, go watch my dedicated video on why you should not make everything public if you haven't seen that one yet. This is one of the easiest things you can do to drastically increase the quality of your code. Just following this one simple rule will make you a 10 times better programmer. Next topic, and this one is really simple, but a very important one, which is tags. This is something that a lot of beginner tutorials use. If you want to identify an object, use a tag. If you want to find an object, use a tag. So it's a simple system that sounds good, but as you grow your programming skills, you will quickly recognize that it has one massive flaw, and that is that it's all based on strings. Strings are a horrible, horrible way of identifying things. The issue is that they are extremely error prone. It is very easy to break something when using string names, and on top of that, it is extremely difficult to debug. If you have some kind of main logic game object and you tag it with the word logic, if you write logic in lowercase, it won't break. If you write logic with a capital I, it looks the same, but it won't break. If you add a zero instead of an O, it won't break. If you had an invisible string in the beginning or end, then again, everything breaks. And like I said, on top of being easy to make mistakes, it also makes it very difficult to find those mistakes. Because all of this code, this is all perfectly valid code. There are no compiler errors. As far as the compiler knows, this is all valid, workable C-sharp code. The problem happens in runtime when this exact string does not match the exact tag. In game development and programming, it's usually unwise to use absolutes like you should never use something or you should always use something. But in this case, this would be the exception where I would say you should definitely never use tags or strings to identify anything. I don't think I've ever seen a good use case for tags. So instead of tags, the better option is to drag the object reference directly, probably by making it a serialized field private. Alternatively, if it's something that exists only one, like a main logic manager, then perhaps use the singleton pattern. Another way for identifying objects is use tag components meaning you make a standard monobehavior component that is completely empty and you just attach that component to something. With that, you can use getComponent or hasComponent to see if the object has that tag component. The important thing about these methods is none of them are based on strings. If you write the wrong class name on a tag component, you will get a compiler error, so the compiler won't even let you run the game. So again, do not use tags and strings for identifying things. And if you're now thinking to yourself, well, I'm way too smart or experienced to fall into that trap of mistyping something, just know that this exact problem happened to me a few months ago while on livestream. Back then, the only place where I used strings was in a find to get child game objects. And even though I was very careful with my names, I still had an error that made no sense. The code did not have any typos, the find string was exactly the same as the object name, except of course it wasn't. After going crazy for a few minutes live on stream, I finally figured it out. Turns out the game object name had an extra invisible space at the end. So, yep, my advice to you is never use tags or strings for identifying things. Next topic, updating UI state, code decoupling, and events. So, as I mentioned a while ago, the main goal with good programming is minimizing complexity. You want to limit how many things you have to keep in your head at the same time. And the best way to do that is with code decoupling, meaning to have systems and scripts as separated from everything else as possible. That way, when you work on a single system, you only have to think about that one system. It doesn't matter how big the rest of the code base is. If that system is nicely decoupled from everything else, then nothing else matters. One example of this, where beginners usually do it wrong, is when it comes to logic and UI. For example, in the video when updating the UI, he has the pipe logic class tell the UI class what to do. Doing it this way means that the scripts are tightly coupled. If you remove the UI script from the project, then everything will break because the logic class expects the UI to exist. The easy way to achieve the coupling in a scenario like this with logic and UI is to use the excellent C# -sharp feature called events, which I've also covered in detail in another video. With events, you can define an event name, kind of like on past pipe. You can define that on something like a bird class, and then you fire that event whenever something happens. Then some other class, like for example a UI class, can listen to that event and do whatever logic it wants, like for example updating the Scortex. That way the bird class does not know and does not want to know that there is a UI element at all. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. All the bird class cares about is that it fires the event into the void. Perhaps someone listens to it, perhaps not. 
In this case, the UI class wouldn't listen to it, but the bird class has no direct connection to it. So if you completely remove the UI class, the code would still compile and everything would work just the same. Another example is on the game over logic. Instead of the bird telling the game over screen to pop up, it should instead fire an event, something like on bird died, then the game over screen can listen to it and show itself. So as a general rule, try to keep logic and UI as separated as possible. If you want your UI to display some kind of state, then don't make the logic class tell the UI what to do, just fire an event and have the UI figure out what to do with that info. Definitely watch my video on events if you haven't seen it, events are insanely useful. Then just a quick mention on something used in video, he used the legacy text component. Unity has two text systems, the legacy text and text mesh pro. Nowadays you should be using text mesh pro, it's much better in every single way. The difference in the code is instead of using unity engine.ui and the class text, you would instead use using tm pro and text mesh pro ugui or text mesh pro, depending if you're referencing a UI text or world text object. Another quick mention is on inputs. Unity also has two systems. There's the legacy input manager and the new input system. In this case, the difference is less pronounced. You can still use the legacy input manager. Personally, I use it all the time in my own videos because it is so much simpler to set up than the new input system. So I always use the legacy input manager for quick demos and prototypes. But in terms of proper features, the new input system is so much better. So go ahead and use the legacy input manager for quick demos and quick prototypes. But as soon as you have a proper project you want to release, you should probably refactor your code to use the new input system. I also covered it in detail in another video. Also something tricky for beginners are the render pipelines. In the video, Mark quickly selected the regular 2D template. Now this template uses what is called the built-in render pipeline. This is the render pipeline that Unity has had for many years. It works great, but nowadays you have two other options. You have AGRP, or the High Definition Render Pipeline, which is the render pipeline you want to use if your game is pushing visuals to their absolute limit. Or you have URP, the Universal Render Pipeline. This one is the option that you should probably be using nowadays. You have many more features like 2D lights, shader graph, and a bunch more. There's a bunch of templates you can download which come with the render pipeline all set up. But in most cases, I would say URP is what you should use. And if you're making PC or console games, then yep, use URP or AGRP. In my case, I always use URP. For example, it's what I'm using to build my next Steam game, Total World Liberation. Another topic that is also a bit tricky for beginners are the versions. Although this one is really only tricky if you try to make it tricky. In the video, Mark showed downloading and installing Unity, and by default, it installed version 2021.3, which is also known as the 2021 LTS version. LTS means long-term support. It's the most stable Unity version. That's the version you should be using in 99% of cases. So if you just follow whatever Unity gives you by default, you're fine. But if you try to dig in, you might be surprised to see that there are quote unquote newer versions. Right now you have version 22.2. .2. So for a beginner, you might think, well, surely I want the absolute latest version. That one would be the best, right? And technically it is, technically it is the most advanced recent version, but that might also come at the cost of some stability. When publishing your games, you really want the engine to be as stable as possible, so that is why they recommend you use the LTS version, which is always one year behind the tech version. So for 99% of cases, you should use the version it automatically selects, which is the LTS or long-term support version. So right now, you should be using 2021 LTS, and in about 6 months, you can use the 2022 LTS. Alright, so those are my more advanced notes on the contents of that video. It's really great, it's an excellent quick overview of the absolute basics. I'm sure that video will help lots of people get started on their own game dev journey. And with this video, I hope you found it useful to hear me talk about these more advanced topics and hopefully you'll learn something new. All right, hope that's useful. Check out these videos to learn some more. Thanks to these awesome Patreon supporters for making these videos possible. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.